to speak very briefly. I'm Gail Russell. I'm the one that conned Lisa in coming out here. We were <laughs> we were at a workshop in November, and I all of a sudden said to her, "Man, I wish you could come to the SUM conference, which is the Saskatchewan Math Teacher Society's conference that's on this Thursday and Friday." And when I told her the dates, she said, "Well, I could come for Friday, but uh, Saturday is our convocation at St. FX, and I have to be there." So. Um, and then as we started talking about it, it just grew. So she presented yesterday in Regina at the U of R, and she's presenting twice today, and then twice again uh, tomorrow. And then she flies home at five o'clock so that she can be there for the ceremonies on Saturday morning. So I'm really pleased she's able to come. You're gonna be just wowed by the stuff that she probably, like wowed in terms of, I think everyone will be able to take something with them and say, that's how I could do things differently. She does very powerful work, but I'm not going to tell you her story because she tells it much better. So, Lisa. Okay, so she's built me up a lot now, so now I have to be really good. Um, so, thank you for having me come. I'm a little paranoid about this mic, but uh, the recording is so. Um, but thanks for having me, and thanks to Gail for inviting me to come out. And I'm doing the Saskatchewan Whirlwind Tour in three days, so it's kind of exciting. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about who I am before I get started on this work that I do. Um, I, I grew up in St. John, Brunswick, um, working class family. Uh, a family that was committed to equity and justice right from the beginning. Um, my grandmothers are both Acadian. And if you know anything about Mi'kmaq heritage, the Acadians and the Mi'kmaq lived together for a long, long time and had quite positive relationships. In fact, as I began learning the Mi'kmaq language, I noticed that there were many French words that found their way into Mi'kmaq, and uh, many Mi'kmaq words, I think, that my grandmothers used when I didn't understand why they had different words for the French things I was learning in school. And uh, my grandmothers both married Anglophones, and in one generation, their language was lost. And so when I went to Mi'kmaq and I began teaching, uh, learning the language was very important to me. And learning, recapturing that piece of, of the Atlantic heritage was very important to me. Um, I, I first started working in Aboriginal communities when I was uh, at St. Bex as a student, as an undergraduate student, um, in an organization called X Project. And X Project was a student society, still is a student society. It's uh, celebrating 50 years this year. Um, that works in African Nova Scotia and Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia, um, working with youth in communities. So we have St. Mike students going out and working in communities with youth, doing leadership, small group educational assistance, recreational kinds of activities. Um, but the real important learning that came from me, from those experiences, was the opportunity to engage with women in those communities and elders in those communities who talked about how education needed to be different for their children. And that was something that I carried with me into my BE program, into my master's, and all throughout my, my career as a teacher. And when I graduated in 1994 from my BE program, I did as all kids who graduated in 1994, I went to the EI office and applied for EI because there was, uh, there was no such thing as a teaching job at that point in time. Um, and I couldn't even get my name on the sub list until the following September. So my parents were living in, in Greater Moncton at the time and I started subbing. And one Saturday morning I was sitting at the hairdressers with my mom and waiting for um, her to finish so I could get my hair cut. And I went down the hall and got my Chronicle Herald as I did every Saturday morning, looking for jobs. And I opened up the job and it said, Well, my First Nation is looking for a math teacher for grade 7 to 12. And I looked at that job and I said to my mother, That is my job. That is where I am meant to be. That's the job I need to do. And I went uh, for two interviews and I got the job and I moved to Waikagwa, to Waikagwa in Cape Breton, and um, the rest, I guess, led to me to be here and to this work um, and to this moment in time. When I began teaching Waikagwa, I wasn't horribly successful initially. 
but I was committed to learning, and I knew that I had to do things differently. So some of the things that I had learned in my BED program weren't going to work. And uh, when you when you have kids who are really trying and still it's not working for them, you realize that you're the one who needs to change. As a teacher, I needed to change, and I needed to listen to my kids to listen to how they were thinking about mathematics, and then to adapt my pedagogy to meet their needs. And at the same time, like I said, learning the language was very, very important to me. And I went to some of the teachers and some of the elders in the school, some of the Mi'kmaq language teachers, and I said, I really want to learn how to count in Mi'kmaq. And they said, great, what are you counting? And I said, what do you mean, what am I counting? And they said, well, what are you counting? And I'm like, well, I'm just counting, like, one, two, three, four. And they said, no, but what are you counting? Because what I learned in that moment was what I'm counting determines how I'm counting. Because animate objects are counted differently than inanimate objects. The words are different. And what I began to realize is that numbers are verbs to me, well, not nouns or adjectives. They're verbs. So in order for things to um, in order to say how many of something there are, you need to know whether they're animate or inanimate because you need to conjugate the verb to match the context. And context matters. And we talk about that in education a lot, but I gotta tell you, in Mi'kmaq education, context really, really, really matters. Because the language is very contextualized. If I'm on the, this side of the window looking out, it's duobity. But if I'm on the outside looking in, the word changes. And I apologize for not remembering what the other word is. But one means on the inside looking out, the other means on the outside looking in. The language is relational. And so we're going to talk a little bit, I'm going to share some of that with you today, how language in particular, the Mi'kmaq language, influenced my understanding of how I needed to teach mathematics differently. So I'm going to share for you um, a model that I developed during my doctoral work and then talk to you a little bit about how that's influencing the work that I'm doing right now. Um, when I went to do my PhD, I had been teaching in Wagoma for 10 years. I had spent about six years as the provincial math leader for all the Mi'kmaq schools in Nova Scotia. I don't know how much you know about Mi'kmaq schools in Nova Scotia, but they're governed by an agreement known as Mi'kmaq Ginala Noe, which is um, an educational agreement that gives them authority, um, jurisdictional control over education. So that began in 1997. I started teaching in Nuevo in, in 1995, so I've been there since the beginning of the Mi'kmaq education agreement. And the schools um, govern themselves and work as a collective in order to negotiate with government, so federal and provincial governments. They are highly successful schools. They have an 88 to 90 percent graduation rate. Of those kids who graduate, the majority of them go on to post-secondary education. Some of them have multiple degrees. I have had the pleasure, as a professor of math education, to get to teach in the BED program and in graduate programs some of the students I taught in junior high and high school. So it's, um, it's kind of neat. In St. since 1996, we have graduated over 120 Mi'kmaq teachers who are now teaching in those schools. And 35 of them have come back from master's degrees, 25 have done language certificates, another 20 have done math certificates. So there's a lot of teachers who are doing a lot of good things to improve education in those schools. But we still struggle with math and science. Kids are not choosing math and science careers at the rates that we would like. The rates of success in high school math and science are not as high as we would like. And so that's sort of where my work sits. How can we get more Mi'kmaq kids engaged in mathematics? And you know, what can we do to make mathematics um, a more enjoyable, more equitable, more appealing subject to be learning? So when I went to do my doctoral work, I thought that I would develop culturally responsive math units and implement them in schools and assess how they worked with kids. And my doctoral supervisor said, that's great, 
not wanting to follow your life's work in my dissertation, because um, <laughs> I was taking on way too much. And what I quickly realized is that I needed to understand where the bumps were and where the challenges were in order to be able to move to that place of developing curriculum materials that could be used in schools. So what I did for my doctoral work is really about the bumps. Where are the bumps? Where are the challenges? Where are the complexities? Where, do these, where does it break down for kids? And so um, that's really what I've been, been working on. And it came to this model. And how this model was developed, I worked with teachers in two schools. One of the um, things that I did before I started my doctoral work, I did what I, I normally do. I went around the community and said, what's the word for, uh, how do you talk about, and I wanted a word that was really, when people come together to solve a problem or talk about an issue, what would that word be? And so a number of elders gave me different words, and, uh, but the one that kept coming up over and over again was Malinyu Dimadin, which means coming together to learn together. And that is really the, the methodology that I used for my research, and it's the spirit in which I engage in communities. It's about learning together. And so each week, or every couple of weeks, I'd go to schools, I'd volunteer in the schools, helping in math classes, and then after school, we would sit and talk about what's going on. What do you notice? What are the challenges? Where are the complexities? Where is it breaking down? What's happening? And as we had those conversations, a number of things emerged. And this model is really kind of a picture of what our conversations were about. Um, at the core, you see that meaningful personal connections to mathematics is really important. Students need to be connected to the mathematics that they're learning. They need to see themselves in it. They need to know that it's important to them and to their community. And if they don't see that, then sometimes they're just not interested. And I think that's true of all kids, not just Aboriginal kids, but all kids need to know why that math is important and why they need to learn it. Um, but perhaps the most important thing I've learned, and I've been alluding to this all along, is that learning from language is essential. And knowing language has probably influenced me more than anything else. And that's supposed to link to something. Let's see if we can get it to link over here. Let's just do this. <laughs> so when I talk about learning from language, there were sort of three key things that came up. One was just the need to use the Mi'kmaq language. A difference when kids hear their own language versus when they're hearing English. So something as simple as saying dosigal or dosajig, conjugating for animate or inanimate, instead of saying how much or how many. Um, so that was important. When kids heard something in their own language, it made them feel safer, more comfortable, more at home and brought them into a space where they felt better about being in the math class. And lots of teachers talked about that. Um, in one of the two schools, there were fewer people who spoke the language. Um, in one school, there were quite a few speakers, so that was a little bit different in the two schools, but even in the school where there were very few speakers, the kids still really wanted to hear the language. Um, one of the big things that I learned was really about asking What's the word for, or is there a word for? And when we had those kinds of conversations about what's the word for, what's the word for flat, for example, um, it revealed a lot of things about mathematics that you might not anticipate. So when I began asking, what's the word for flat, for elders? Because you know we use that word pretty much. We take it for granted that all kids have a good understanding of flat. Um, when we're teaching geometry, we're talking about a face being a flat surface. Um, but I wasn't getting a word for flat. It wasn't sort of an instantaneous. And so I gave examples like, well, what about your tire? What if it's out of you know? What if you have a flat tire? And a colleague of mine who teaches me, mom, said I, I would never say it that way. I would say it's out of there. Because it's not really flat. Like it's, it's sort of, you know, out of there. It's, that's what makes it flat. It's the out of there. 
And uh, I said, well, what about calm water? And, but the word for calm water in Mi'kmaq means it has the potential to move. It, in fact, it's the negation of not, like it's not rough, is what it literally means. And then I also asked about the bottom of the basket. So what about the bottom of the basket? Like, you know, it's flat. And an elder said to me, no, it's just, it lets it sit still. It's just the bottom of the basket. That's what lets it sit still. And so this notion of there being no word for flat in Mi'kmaq, made me begin to question some of the taken for granted assumptions that we have when we're teaching mathematics. We just assume that kids know what flat means. But if it's not a word that's commonly used in the community, it might not be a word that's commonly used in kids' vocabulary. And it's interesting to me because we have this myth in education that we often tell kids that people used to believe the world was flat. But in Nigma, there's no word for flat. And the word for world, Sinama, literally translates to sitting on the surface of a sphere. So, some people thought the world was flat, but not all, obviously. Another conversation we had during these was, what's the word for middle? And one of the teachers in the school, one of the schools came and said, I want to know what the word for middle is. Because she had had a student who had had an assessment, and the person doing the assessment said, you know, well, he couldn't point to the object in the middle. I don't think he has very good listening skills. And the teacher's counter-argument was, I don't think he understands what the word middle means. And so she came to one of these after-school sessions, like, just kind of, you know, she was all fired up because she, <laughs> she was a little bit upset about the results of this assessment. Uh, and very passionate about it, and she came in and she said, okay, I want to know what the word for middle is. And we had this long conversation. You don't need to be able to read the conversation. But during this conversation, two Big Mom speaking teachers talked about all these different contexts in which you might use a word that sort of describes something that could represent middle, but not really in the case that the child had been exposed to. And so at the end of this conversation, the teacher who had come in at the beginning said, right, so it's not a word you would typically use. And so this notion of taking for granted that kids have an idea of some words may actually be problematic. I myself have fallen into this trap. One day I was uh, teaching a class to the mom teachers, a math class. We were doing polygons and we were talking about lines of symmetry. And in polygons, sometimes the lines of symmetry go through the vertices and sometimes they go through the midpoints. And so I was pointing to a midpoint and I said, what would you call this? Hoping that someone in the class would say middle. So I could say yes, and that's why mathematicians call it the midpoint. Except I was teaching for a full of Mi'kmaq teachers. No one in the class called it middle. Not a single person. They said, go halfway. In Mi'kmaq, that directly translates to ahadayik. They said, center. <laughs> they said, miyawe, which is sort of like about around halfway. <laughs> but not middle. And then I started to laugh, and then I told them this story, and then we had a wonderful conversation about the complexities of language and teaching mathematics, and it turned out to be a wonderful teachable moment. But even I, having written about this, wasn't paying attention enough to notice that, hey, I was asking for language that maybe wasn't the first initial response. And so this whole notion of trying to learn from language, what's the word for, or is there a word for, these kinds of questions are really important. The other big thing that you'll see there is the notion of nominalization and verbification. Nominalization is a real word. Verbification is one I made up. Um, they said when you get a PhD, you can do that. Um, so, nominalization is a process where we take things and we turn them into nouns. 
And mathematics does this a lot. You take the act of joining sets together and you call it addition. You take the act of comparing or separating and you call it subtraction. You take a line and you talk about how it's moving up this way, only we don't want to talk about how it's moving, we want to call that slope. Mathematics fixes and freezes things. It nominalizes things. It's a process in mathematics that has a purpose, but the problem is, is we present it to kids in its nominalized form. So what I mean by that is that when mathematicians are actually working, they're discovering, they're doing, they're creating, they're verbing, they're doing active things. But when they figure something out, they want to fix it. So they name it, and they freeze it, and it stays fixed and frozen. But they do that so then they can do new things with it. So they can verb it some more. But what we do in schools is we present it to kids in its fixed and frozen form. So we come in and we say, today class we're going to learn about multiplication. Today class we're going to learn about slope. I mean, and I did this for years. I had my kids singing slope is rise over run to the tune of band on the run. Rise over run, rise over run. It didn't work, right? So one day I just said, tell me about the graph. How is it changing? How do I get from one point to the next? And suddenly kids were saying, well, miss, like, if you just go over two and up three, you're back on the graph. Like, every time, you just go over two and up three. Go over two and up three. Do you see the verbs? Do you see the action? Mi'kmaq and all indigenous languages in Canada are verb-based. They are inherently active. They use verbs as their primary foundational piece. So when I talk about things When I talk about things like a line, really, I would describe that as ikka, it goes straight, or bektadek, from here to there, it more or less goes straight. There's motion in it. There's a sense of movement. When I talk about yinisquigiyak, it means this, forming into a point. So we talk about lines coming together. They're forming into a point. So shapes are active. When I talk about a circle, it's empisawik. It means it's moving around. It's the points that are going around. There's motion in it. But in mathematics, the way we present it in schools, it's static. It's not dynamic. It's flat, it's fixed, it's frozen. And when we present that fixed and frozen mathematics to kids, what happens is we deny them the process that came to that, fi that fixed mathematics. There was a whole process that went before that. So verbifying to me is really about exposing that process, unfreezing the mathematics, letting kids come to it through understanding the process, through doing the mathematics and coming to an understanding and then we name it. So after my kids started talking about how the graph was changing, I could say, yeah, you know, mathematicians name everything. That rate of change we've been talking about, mathematicians call that slope. What's really interesting is if kids are successful in mathematics, eventually they get to a point where people let them talk in more verbs. But you have to go through a whole lot of nouns before you get to the good stuff. Right? Uh, Bill Barton is inclined to say that in his book, Language and Mathematics, which is a great read if you're interested, um, he says, we let very young children and research mathematicians play with mathematics. And in between, we sit them down and tell them how it is. Right? So, in these sessions, we actually had a group of kids doing prisons and pyramids. So I was volunteering in one of the classes one day, and we were giving kids shapes. We just were sitting around, this was a grade three class, getting them to talk about the shapes that they were given. So one little girl took her cube, and she sat it on the carpet, and she said, it can sit still. 
And I thought about the flat. And I thought about the elder who said, the bottom of the basket is just what lets it sit still. And I thought, isn't that cool? And I shared that story with a friend of mine, Walter Whiteley, who's a geometer at York University. And he said, you know the word polyhedron, which we use to describe those many-sided shapes? He said, a lot of people think that polyhedron means many sides. But hedra actually comes from the word, Greek word for seat. So what it really means is many seats, or many ways to sit, or many ways to sit still, if you will. So the origins of polyhedra actually has its root in a verbified form, many ways to sit. It can sit in many ways. But it's become nominalized over the years. So these are the kinds of things that make me think we need to change how we talk about mathematics. And that talking about mathematics differently can actually create more access opportunities for all kids. These kids also in this Prisms and Pyramids class would talk about how prisms did this <laughs> and pyramids did this. Right? So they were using that sense of motion, that active engagement with language. It was about what they were doing, not about what they were. So when you think about pyramids doing this, and the word Guinness squiggy up, even though I don't think any of those kids would have known what Guinness squiggy up meant, because many of them were not speakers, they were still thinking with Mi'kmaq grammar structures. And that is a really important thing. There is a difference between speaking English and thinking English. And a lot of teachers will say to me, oh, well, all the, all the Aboriginal kids in my class, they all speak English, so it's not a big deal. I don't have to think about that much. But time and time again, it has occurred in research and in my own personal experiences that kids are using the grammar structures of their first language even if they don't speak it. Because they're learning it from people who do. They're learning English in those contexts. And the grammar structures from the Mi'kmaq language are influencing how adults in the community speak English. Therefore, the English that the kids are learning are that verbified Mi'kmaq form of English. And so they are. Even though these kids, many of them were not speakers, they were using those grammar structures and it was evident in the way they were thinking about the mathematics. So this has really been a huge piece of learning for me. That language is really at the heart of changing mathematics. And we need to understand that our thinking is embedded in our language. Our ways of knowing are embedded in our language. And that is true for every child in our classroom. So we need to think about how they are thinking about mathematics. And if they're thinking about it in an active, dynamic, verbified way, then we need to be engaging and teaching it in an active, dynamic, verbified way. By the way, when I talk to mathematicians about verbification, they say, well, that's just what we do. We do verbs. That's our thing. William Myers wrote a book not that long ago, I can't remember what it's called, but you know, he talked about that active nature of mathematics, that mathematicians do this very active thing. But how we present it to kids is not like that. And so I really believe that verbifying mathematics would be better for every child in this country and would definitely benefit Aboriginal kids in this country. Another big piece that I learned was values. We need to think about the values that are embedded in our mathematics. People like to think that math is no values, it's just math. I mean, just two plus two is four, it just is. In fact, the guy who fixed my shoes the other day told me that. Oh, math is easy, two plus two is four. It doesn't matter who you are or where you go, two plus two is four. That's a pretty simplified version of mathematics. Ubi D'Ambrosio says, we teach quadratic equations, but we never teach children that they're the very thing that allow us to bomb other countries. Mathematics is not value-free. 
Think about the questions that kids are asked in schools. Oftentimes, it's about selling stuff or buying stuff. Whose agenda is that? And in Aboriginal culture, one of the things I have found interesting when I'm working with elders in the Mi'kmaq communities and trying to get at concepts of number, I almost always fail to do so. Because when I ask questions of how much or how many, thinking about when number would be used, I always get one answer, and the answer is dibiyat. And dibiyat in Mi'kmaq means enough. And it is almost always accompanied with a spatial gesture. Dibia, ah, oh, dibia, ah, oh, dibia. And I asked him about this, and I said, you know, why is it that <laughs> it's always about space and not about number? And then one elder said to me, well, space doesn't tell you enough, or number doesn't tell you enough. If it's a matter of survival, it's about space. If it's a matter of feeding your family, it's not about seven potatoes. It's enough potatoes to fill the pot to here. Because this is how many I need for my family. And if they're small potatoes, I need more. And if they're big potatoes, I need less. But what I need is enough. And I'm not going to take more than I need, because I don't want to waste. But I need enough. And if it's about enough firewood to get through the winter, then it has to fill that space behind the shed. Because I need enough. And it doesn't matter if they're big logs or small logs, I'm going to need enough. And so, when I inquired more into this, working with the elders and, and language instructors in the communities, I said, but you know, there's really sophisticated number concepts in, in Mi'kmaq. Like, you know, I told you my story of trying to learn to count. I'm still not very good at learning to count because there's so many different conjugations. And, uh, and sometimes the words change. And um, so, and there's this game called Waltus, which is a, a bowl of dice and sticks, and, and you bang the bowl on the ground, and you get points if you get like five up or one down, or five down and one up, or all six up or all six down. And there's stories that go with the game. But there's a very sophisticated counting system in the game. In the first round, you count the base three, in the next round, you count the base one, and there can be third and fourth and fifth rounds. I haven't learned to count them that high. Um, but there's very sophisticated things that you have to do. Like, when you get so many points, you trade them for an old man or an old woman, and if you get three old women, you, get, you trade that for an old man, and they're worth five or fifteen. And so I said, you know, there's number. And they said, well, number is for play. We play with number, games. We have games that involve number, counting, quantity. But space is for survival. But here's the problem. Mathematics values counting as a primary foundational skill. In the Western Protocol curriculum, if you look at the grade kindergarten curriculum document, there are nine number outcomes and six others. And very few of those number outcomes deal directly with spatial awareness of number. And there is a tool that is used quite widespread across this country called the EDI. You know what that is? And it assesses kids and says whether or not they're vulnerable for future failure. And the majority of the items on that are about counting and number, and naming quantities. Counting forward and counting backward. And if kids can't do that, they're vulnerable. But never do we say kids who don't have a spatial awareness are vulnerable. And never do we say kids who have spatial awareness are gifted. But a lot of our Aboriginal kids who we had assessed in school came back gifted with visual spatial skills but we're never allowed to tap into those skills in schools. And visual spatial awareness is the foundation of mathematical reasoning in Mi'kmaq communities and probably many Aboriginal communities. So mathematics as a subject, as we teach it, has inherent things that it values 
and inherent things that it doesn't value. And we've just adopted the Western Protocol in Nova Scotia, and the one thing that makes me sad is how little geometry is there. It's a considerably less amount of geometry than we had in our old curriculum. And that is a place where kids who are strong spatially can actually do really well. And not only that, but it's really, really important to be able to reason geometrically and spatially if you want to be, oh, I don't know, an engineer or an architect or a chemist. Um, Geometry is a foundational part of a lot of other subjects. We keep marginalizing it and marginalizing it. So mathematics does have values in it. And mathematics also emerges in response to issues. The mathematics in the world has emerged in response to questions that people have had, wonderings that they've had. And no different than in the new block here. One of the very first elder conversations I had after I began my PhD um, was with a woman by the name of Diane Tony. And Diane was a pillbox maker. I'll show you what her pillboxes look like, actually. That's one of Diane's pillboxes. So these are made with porcupine quills and birch bark. And so how you make a quill box, you begin with a circle of bark, and then you make a ring to go around your circle, and then you take your quills and you wrap them. And they dye the quills, and they make patterns with them. Um, I, I actually bought a whole bunch of quills this year <laughs> for a project that we're working on, and had to explain to my accounting office that I was paying someone to, for a roadkill. Um, <laughs> it did, they were like, what? Anyway, it did, it, it's hard to convince the university that it's important to have roadkill in my office, um, or at least the remnants of it. But Diane said to me, you know, Lisa, I always start my pattern in the center of the circle. And I said, okay, Diane, how do you find the center of the circle? She said, well, I just fold it in half twice. Fold it in half, fold it in half again, that's the center. This is a theorem we used to teach in high school geometry that two intersecting diameters actually meet in the center of the circle. Diane said, no, no, it's just common sense. Um, and then she said, and you know, Lisa, in order to make the ring to go around the circle, I just measure three times across the circle and add a thumb, and it makes a perfect ring every time. So I got excited. I was like, that's pie. And she said, no, it's common sense. Uh, and Elder taught that to me. And what's important is that Diane did not need a Greek mathematician to teach her about pi. She knew that the ratio of the circumference to the diameter was three and a little bit. And when I told this story, actually, uh, to other community members, they say yes. And if you're making a hamper, which is a bigger basket, it's three and a hand with. Proportional reasoning is there. And no mathematician needed to come in and, and teach them how to do that. That's just knowledge that's always been there. Now Diane, unlike some mathematicians, is not concerned about how many digits of pi we can approximate um, or calculate. But she's interested in the purposefulness of that mathematical knowledge because it helps her to make her baskets. Well, it helped her. Unfortunately, Diane has since passed away. She's been a huge influence on my work, though. It keeps appearing in random places. I hear stories like one day we were in need of some bark, and a young man in the community brought me a great big tub of bark. And I said, where did you get this? And he said, oh, well, I had collected it for Diane. And I thought, well, you're still watching over us, Diane. But that notion of valuing enough, valuing the connectedness, the context, and learning the mathematics from it. Diane also said to me, you know, school-based mathematics is important for kids because they need to go on to university and school and get the degrees and diplomas and things that we need for them. But learning some Mi'kmaq mathematics would be good for their common sense because she really didn't believe there was any common sense or any connectedness in what we were doing in schools. 
We're talking about a language that's inherently spatial. We're talking about spatial reasoning being the foundation of mathematical reasoning in Mi'kmaq communities. So it makes sense that a lot of kids are visually, spatially strong. And so we need to be incorporating those visual, spatial aspects of learning into our math class. One of the conversations we had um, during my, my research conversations with folks was, you know, there's a common misconception that we need to teach kids multiplication before we can teach them division. And one of the teachers in this school said, you know, when I was growing up, it was my dad who helped me think about mathematics. He was a strong Mi'kmaq speaker, and he would ask me questions like, well, you know, if you want to share 21 things with your friends, you know, you, it's you and your two friends, you got, there's three of you, how many would you get each? And so he used division as a way to teach her multiplication. Because he went from the whole to the part. And that's common for kids who are visual spatial learners are much more whole to part thinkers than part to whole thinkers. But a lot of what we do in mathematics is part to whole. So we will often teach kids um, mathematics in a way that sort of takes all the little parts. And then once you get all the little parts, you get the whole. But really, for a lot of kids, it might be better to start with the whole and break out the little parts. Right? So giving them 24 squares and saying, how many different ways can you make a rectangle with these 24 squares? And we've actually done that with kids in classes. And they can figure out what the dimensions of all the rectangles that have an area of 24 are. And then they realize that those are the factors of 24 and those are the numbers that you multiply together to get 24. And so we want to go from whole to part. It doesn't mean we stop going from part to whole. It means we offer both of those experiences. And that helps kids who are thinking differently to have new ways to access that mathematics. Have to double click on this. I'm used to my map, but it's just a one click. Um, the last piece is is this cultural connections piece, and this is the piece I thought that I was going to do first. Right? This is what I went to do my PhD to do. I was going to go create culturally based math units and implement them in schools. But what I realized now is that there was no way I could have done this in a meaningful way until I had done all the other pieces. So until I had figured out what were the parts, what were the bumps, where were the complexities, how did we need to be engaging, I don't think any of this could have been done authentically. And um, I'll reference uh, my colleague Ed Doolittle, who some of you may know, he works at First Nations University of Regina. A mathematician and one of my very first um, sort of grad student experiences after I foolishly quit my job in my mid-30s and decided to go back to grad school, uh, I went to the Canadian Math Education Study Group and Ed was the keynote speaker. And he was talking about the complexities of ethnomathematics. And he talked about that sometimes it can trivialize. To call a TP a comb loses a lot of what that TP really is. It's a place for gathering, a place for spiritual things to happen, a place for the family to come together. It's not just a comb. And and you know, Ed said, we know a lot about the benefits of learning mathematics, but we know little about the cost. And Michelle Gutierrez, who's a, a scholar in the U.S., um, works a lot with Latino, Latina populations, writes a lot about equity. She's also talked about what is the cost of participation. And if children don't see their values, their identity, their culture embedded in mathematics, do they have to change who they are in order to learn that mathematics? How do you maintain your identity 
and take on someone else's ways of thinking. And so for me, understanding that mathematics is a way of thinking that can happen across all cultures, but may happen differently in different cultures. It may have a spatial base instead of a numerical base. That when we open up that opportunity, we can allow kids to learn mathematics without forcing them to change their identity. And that can help to mitigate the cost of participation. Some kids choose to opt out of mathematics because they simply see it as asking them to be someone they're not, or think in ways that they're not comfortable thinking in. And so we have to be really careful that we don't oversimplify. You know, a story problem about going to buy stuff at a powwow instead of a market is not culturally based mathematics. Circling for teepees instead of for ducks is not culturally based mathematics. Culturally based mathematics is understanding the stories of traditional knowledge that elders have and building mathematics from it. So when I think about Diane's story, and in fact we have done this, um, you're welcome to take one of these lesson plans on the discovery, or lesson activities, I guess, on the discovery of Pi, um, using Diane's pillbox story as a base. So we start with Diane's pillboxes, and we talk about, does that always work? How did Diane know that? And we get kids to make circles, and we get them to make rings, and we get them to compare and measure three times across and add a thumb. Does it make a ring? Yeah. How come? Okay, let's measure that. What's the relationship between those two things? Is it always three and a little bit? A little bit more than three? And then we get them to research pi. Because the Greeks had this idea of pi. And so what we're doing is building from local knowledge to the broader global knowledge. And we want kids to see that mathematics is a part of who they are. It's a part of their own cultural heritage. Mathematical thinking has always been there. Aboriginal people always knew the world was round. Um, and so what we've done in Nova Scotia, we actually developed a program called Show Me Your Math. And uh, there's a website at showmeyourmath.ca. I'll show you that in a minute if I can bring it up here. Um, but after that initial conversation with Diane, I knew that kids needed to have conversations with elders. Because it didn't make sense for them to have conversations, for elders to con have conversations with me, for me to have conversations with teachers, and then for teachers to have conversations with the kids. Because the elders could just talk to the kids directly. You've all played the telephone game, you know the message gets viewed. Um, so we wanted kids to talk directly to elders, and we originally thought that we would do, um, I was working with Dave Wagner, who was my doctoral supervisor at the University of New Brunswick, and uh, we originally thought we would do just like a help desk contest. Atlantic Canada First Nation help desk would often put on monthly contests. And we thought, well, we'll do a monthly contest and we'll get kids to do projects and submit the projects and we'll post them online and it will be fun. They can interview elders, they can make videos or make a poster or something. Um, so we went and we met with teachers. And the teachers said, yeah, that's great. We love the idea. We had lots of debates about the kinds of things that kids could do. Um, but what the teachers wanted to do is they wanted to have a math fair. They wanted to have a day where all the kids came together and showed off their math. And so what we did is we decided that each school would have a local math fair and then they would pick some of the kids who had more exemplary projects, maybe not the best project, but maybe one that was really interesting culturally or the kids could really speak well about it. And they would come to a math fair and uh, we're actually having our math fair next Wednesday this year. We've had, this will be the eighth math fair that we've had. Um, we usually have between two and 300 kids. There are about a little less than 3,000 kids in Mi'kmaq schools in Nova Scotia. And every year I would say anywhere between 2,000 and 2,500 of them do show your math projects. And one of the movements that we've been having is having more elders come into the classrooms to actually teach whole classes 
about things that the kids can then learn the mathematics from. And it has proven to be quite successful. Um, there's nothing really that makes me happier than seeing a whole bunch of kids uh, talking about math in really interesting ways. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the projects that we've been doing over the years. One of them, remember I, I told you about Divi Up enough. And in our old grade 10 curriculum in Nova Scotia, there was a unit on the geometry of packaging where the purpose of that unit was for kids to decide um, what was the most economical container, had the best economy rate. So that is a container that uses the least amount of material to create the maximum capacity. And so one of the teachers in my old school actually, she decided that since the kids were doing the geometry of packaging, she would get an elder to come in and teach them how to make baskets. Because the baskets, packaging, it kind of goes together. What she didn't realize is how well it went together. Because when she called the elder, um, she said, you know, I'd like you to come in and teach baskets to the kids. And the elder said, well, do you have a big class or a small class? And she said, well, actually, I've got quite a big class this year. There's 23 kids in Math 10 this year. And she said, well, okay, I think we'll make this one because I think, you know, I don't have a lot of strips left. And I think, we, you know, we want to make a good size container for the kids. So we'll make this one. What did she make? The answer to the unit. She brought in this basket and she taught the kids to make that basket. It's a cylinder where the height of the cylinder is equal to the diameter of the cylinder. That is the answer to the problem in the unit. That is the best package. It has the best economy rate. Why was the elder making it? Because it was a big class and she didn't have that many strips and she wanted to make sure they all got a good size basket. She knew about enough. She knew how to make the most out of the least amount of resources. And the kids said, we had to do all this math and she just already knew it. <laughs> it was common sense to the elder who was teaching baskets. So that was sort of a rewarding experience. Another uh, little story that's come out uh, is a game called Gundagel. And Gundagel is about, uh, it's called little stones, or picking up little stones and taking them in your hand and throwing them up in the air and catching them on the back of your hand. And it was a counting game. So we've since turned it into um, a partitioning activity for kindergarten and grade one. So your number of the day is seven. So how many of the stones might be in your hand and how many of the stones might have fallen into the sand? And we begin by telling the elder story and then letting the kids partition using the stones and the mat. Some of the other things that we've done, um, the same elder who told her granddaughter this story about Gwen Gagel, I, I was doing some follow-up work with her saying, you know, what are some of the other kinds of things that we could do? Because one of the big things about Show Me Your Math is that although the teachers are appreciating that the kids are getting excited about mathematics, they also have these pressures of completing their outcomes. And so they wanted me to connect outcomes to activities. And so I've been taking the ideas that the kids generate and then trying to turn them into lesson ideas that teachers can use in their classrooms. And so I was speaking with one of the elders who had helped me um, with this. And, and I said, what other kinds of things did kids do um, when you were young? Like that would be like counting or mathy kinds of stuff. And she said, you know, there's when I was young, my mother used to pull little thin strips of bark off the logs and give us those and ask us if we could fold them and bite shapes into them. And of course, the idea of folding paper, bark, and biting shapes into it was exciting to me. But it was also exciting to me because I had seen birch bark biting before. I'd actually seen it here in Saskatchewan um, one time when I was at, at the University of Regina for a conference. But I didn't know at the time that it was something that people had done in Mi'kma'ki. And so I was like, do people do birch bark biting here? And she said, yeah, you know, I, th I think they did. Like, I remember doing it as a kid, and I remember my mom kind of encouraging us to do it. But it's kind of a pastime or whatever. 
So I did some research, um, and I found an article called, I'm the last one who can do this, or who can do it. And they had gone across the country and interviewed women in Aboriginal communities who were birch bark buyers, who all kept saying, I think I'm one of the last people in my community who can do this. And on the second page of the article, I read about a woman I knew, Margaret Johnson, who had been an elder from Eskazoni. Um, several years ago, St. Abex gave her an honorary doctorate for her commitment to language and culture. And uh, everyone in Mi'kma'ki called her Dr. Granny. <laughs> and sadly, Dr. Granny had passed away a couple of years before I found this article. Um, but in the article, it said that her, her sister, in another community was also known to have done it. And I knew right away who that was, because I knew her sister. Uh, she lived in the community where I lived, and she was somewhat like an adopted grandmother to me, and she had passed away six months before I found this article. And her name was Caroline Gould, and she was known to be a famous basket maker, but I didn't know that she had been a birch bark fighter. And so that inspired me to learn more about birch bark biting and to learn it well enough that I could teach it to others. And so that's what I did. I spent a summer working with a BED student of mine who's actually from Saskatchewan and now teaching back in Saskatchewan. And we taught ourselves to do birch bark biting <laughs> from YouTube videos. <laughs> and, um, and then we taught some kids. And what's phenomenal about this is that since we've been teaching kids, we've heard all kinds of stories about people who used to birch bark bite, and stories about you know seeing Auntie Galilee doing birch bark biting at the basket shop. And the kids, the visualization, the geometry, the awareness of space that has to happen in order to actually do birch bark biting is phenomenal. Um, I'm gonna show you some of the work that some of the students have done. This fighting was done by Kimberly, who is in grade seven. Well, she's in grade eight now. This was done last year when she was in grade seven. This was one of her very early ones. Um, the very first day we taught them how to do it, her very first design was more elaborate than anything I've ever been able to create. It was phenomenal. Um, this is another one that she did, very early one that she did. Uh, this one was done by her cousin Phoenix, who was also in grade seven at the time. Um, Phoenix came to us one day, myself and his teacher, and said, I finally figured out how to make an eight point star. And he was so proud of it. But he had been doing all this reasoning, all this visualizing to figure out how that would happen. There's another one done by Kimberly. Uh, this again was done by Phoenix. You see his eight point star there. And one more that was done by Phoenix. And literally we've had hundreds of kids learn how to do this. But what happens is they're learning all kinds of mathematics. Um, when we were learning how to fold the paper, and I was asking Josephine, is there a word for that? When you fold it in half, and then you fold it in half the other way. See, I think I have a sheet of... Oh, look, I have a piece of bar here. Um, have a bar for trouble. You fold it in half, and then you fold it in half again. And I said, Josephine, is there a word for that? She said, you have to make sure you line this up and make the creases really good. And she said, yes, debt by God. And I said, what does that mean? She said, fold it the right way. <laughs> but it's interesting because it actually is about alignment, making it actually right. And then I do like a little paper airplane fold to make my triangles. And then if you're really keen, you can make more triangles. But when you're doing this, you're folding it in half, and then quarters, and then eighths, and then sixteenths if you do one more fold like I've done. And what's really good is for middle school kids, this fractional language comes out instinctively. And 
one day the teacher that I was working with said her grade sevens were debating whether or not they were folding one eighth or two eighths, or biting one eighth or two eighths, because you know technically their top tooth was biting an eighth and their bottom tooth was biting an eighth, so they thought they were biting two eighths of the pattern, and others were saying no, it's really just one eighth because it's this eighth. And she was like, I don't really care. They were just arguing about fractions. <laughs> it's great. Um, so then you just kind of. Great way to keep middle school kids quiet. <laughs> and you do a few little bitings and you unfold it. And you get a cool little pattern. You can come up and have a look at that after. It's hard to see from a distance. Um, but what's really interesting is that we get to talk a lot about the symmetry, reflective symmetry, rotational symmetry. We get to talk about the core of the pattern, where it was folded. It's an active thing, so instead of talking about lines of symmetry, we actually begin with talking about how did, how did someone create this, where was it folded, right? And so when we talk about where it was folded, that's where the lines of symmetry appear. Um, so it has been, it has been a, a really great activity. Another one that we did last year with kids was paddle making. I began with wanting to make a canoe, um, but both the Make My Language teacher and my colleague in my faculty who teaches outdoor ed told me I was crazy, that it would take too long, it would be too expensive. Um, but my outdoor ed colleague said, but we could make paddles. And then he started talking to me about paddles and talking to um, the teachers in the school about paddles and they got really excited because what we realized is that uh, the canoe paddle actually has a lot of indigenous knowledge embedded in it. And paddles look different in different parts of the country because the land tells you what the paddle needs to look like. The land teaches you. So in, in Cape Breton, in Nova Scotia, the paddles are shorter because the rivers are shallow. And in mainland Nova Scotia, the paddles are longer down in the southern part of Nova Scotia because the rivers are more deep. And in different parts of the country, there are different kinds of paddles that were designed for different purposes. And even in Nigamangi, there were different kinds of paddles that were designed for different purposes, whether you were in a lake or a river or out in the ocean. And different kinds of canoes, too. Ocean canoes versus river and lake canoes. And so we've actually had kids, um, a group of grade eights, design paddles. They had to use symmetry, they had to use measurement, they had to use fractions. Um, and you see here a couple of boys with their, oh, something happens. 